Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, and I'm a free range scholar and methods guru with Sage Method Space. And I'm pleased to be joined here today with Helen Cara, who is an independent researcher and scholar, um, to talk about independent research and scholarship, which is our theme this month. But before we get started, if you are new to Method Space, uh, this is a site sponsored by Sage Publishing, and we are interested in everything to do with planning, designing, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, and sharing results in ways that will make a difference. And you can see at the center of this diagram, we have teaching and learning because we feel that whether you are an experienced scholar or someone who is brand new, uh, we all have something to learn. So um, welcome, uh, Helen, and why don't you just uh, briefly introduce yourself? Well, hello, it's lovely to be here. I'm in the UK where I was born and where I've always lived uh, and where I work as an independent researcher and scholar, as you said. I've been an independent researcher now for 23 years and an independent scholar for 11 years, so nearly half of the time. Um, I did a various other jobs before that, um, but I love my work. Now I work alone in an office in my garden and I'm very happy. So, you know, as I said in my intro, I mean, I have coined the term a free range scholar when I stopped uh, teaching in a faculty position. Um, but you've been independent from the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about why you made that decision? Actually, it wasn't so much a decision. It was more of a kind of accident. Um, my first degree was a research degree. I didn't even know it was going to be a research degree till I got to university. I studied mm -hmm. uh, social psychology at the London School of Economics, um, but it was a BSc and it was fully research based, pure quant in those days. It was all quantitative research, mm -hmm. three solid years. And I enjoyed it a lot, but I didn't want to continue. And I went to work in other fields. I was I was a, worked in training for a while. I was a training administrator, and then I was a social worker for a bit. I worked in the voluntary sector for some time. And I moved from London uh, to where I live now, a small market town in the middle of England. And as I was getting to know people here, some people I'd met said, would I be able to help? With a research project that they needed mm -hmm. doing and I thought well yes probably I did do a degree in this probably I can help I had a look at it got some books out of the library because that's how we rolled in those days this was 1999 mm -hmm. and decided that yes I could help and I did help and it went well I enjoyed doing it the people I did it for liked what I did word got around mm -hmm. and I was asked to do more and I just fell into it like that really it wasn't a clear decision it was just I was already self-employed mostly doing proofreading and copy editing for academic publishers. So it was a kind of natural progression mm -hmm. in a sense. So um, you then went on to, to do a lot of, of research for clients. Can you just you know, give us you know, maybe an example of, of the types of projects that you would do as an independent researcher for clients, which I think you know, is somewhat different than the process someone might use doing research, you know, within an academic institutional framework? I think it's very different. It's, it's much more applied research. Mm -hmm. um, you're rarely asked to do a literature review. Now and again, some people did ask for that and I would do it. Um, but that was rare. More often you'd be asked to analyze some documents or just collect some contextual mm -hmm. information for background, um, perhaps statistical information. I worked mostly in, around the interface between social care and health mm -hmm. uh, and a lot with children and families because of my social work background primarily. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, because in the year 2000, I applied for and was appointed as a consultant to the UK government's Sure Start unit, which was then the first cross-party unit setting mm -hmm. up Sure Start programs, area-based initiatives, a bit like the Head Start you have mm -hmm. in the US, mm -hmm. um, area-based initiatives to support families with young children who are struggling for whatever reason. And I worked with Sure Start for some years, and then with different Sure Start programs, I was helping them to set up, but then once they were set up, they needed help with evaluation research, and I was able to offer that mm -hmm. assistance. Um, so I did a lot of that, and a lot of work for early years, units in local government, 
Um, and this was a lot of it was evaluation research, but not all. Some of it was mm -hmm. information gathering. Like I remember doing projects on what kind of information um, different categories of parents needed, parents of disabled children or parents mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. um, minority ethnic children and whether they were getting the information they needed, if not, mm -hmm. what could be done to improve that. Um, so it was a very wide range. I have always loved the variety in this job and that's only mm -hmm, increased mm -hmm. as time has gone on. So for those kinds of projects, would you create a report, kind of a white paper type of a document? Often it was just a kind of internal report for the people who'd commissioned mm -hmm. the research, um, but it did vary. I mean, I do remember one um, piece of work I did in the mid 2000s in a part of Wolverhampton, a city close to where I live. Uh, it was a suburb that it was quite a quite a deprived area. And I was working closely with a group in the community mm -hmm. and I needed to write the standard sort of report brick of paper for the commissioners. But the community mm -hmm. group I was working with said, well, we don't want that. That's boring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to read all that. Can't right. you make a report that we can read with our kids at right. bedtime? Right. So that was a real <laughs> challenge. Right. And that was such a fun assignment. I enjoyed doing that mm -hmm. so much. It was online for quite some time and I was able to give it, to, you know, show it to people mm -hmm. as an example. Mm -hmm. But then the centre I'd worked for closed after some years and the website went. I still have mm -hmm. a copy of the report, of course, but it has photos and so on. So I, I don't feel I can use right. it anymore ethically. Um, although probably if I'd just downloaded it as a random PDF I'd found, I'd feel like it was mm -hmm. okay to do that. So it's interesting how things have changed in, in those respects over right. the years. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, they, they assume that, that the institution they are affiliated with is what provides some credibility to, you know, their reputations as researchers. But you've been able to establish uh, credibility and respect as a researcher in the UK in particular, um, and, and, you know, more recently, more recent years around the world, um, including being a, the first independent researcher as a research fellow. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'm not quite sure I was the first independent researcher as a okay. research fellow. I was, I was certainly the first to be conferred as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, okay. which is not quite the same thing, but a great honor. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, that was in 2015. And that was because of the book I wrote on creative research methods primarily. Mm -hmm. But I did pay attention to my own education when I found I was, I had suddenly uh, unexpectedly become an independent researcher. I thought, well, okay, I have a research degree, first degree, but I think I need to skill up. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I went and did a master's in social research methods. I'm still in contact with my dissertation supervisor, who's always been a great friend and a great support mm -hmm. to me. And then when I finished that, I wasn't done. I wasn't done with studying. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. I got a real bug for studying and learning. So I went and did a PhD, uh, which I was awarded in 2006. And that opened doors for me that I didn't expect because... I just wanted a PhD because I was enjoying studying. I was really mm -hmm. having fun. Um, and I thought it would be, you know, good for my career as a researcher. But what I didn't see coming was a massive recession in the UK after a change of government here in 2010. And that meant my networks imploded and suddenly I wasn't getting right. work. Right. And I had my income just plummeted. I had to get a, an actual proper job part time for a couple of years, um, which we'll gloss over. Um, but I reinvented myself as an independent scholar from that time. I knew mm. in the last year, I guess, of my PhD that I wanted to write a research methods book, but I didn't figure out what that book would be till 2011 mm -hmm. when I had more time to think. Mm -hmm. And I started writing it, but then I realized I needed access to academic literature. And I found out that one way to achieve that was to, to get a fellowship with a university department. Mm -hmm. And I looked around. And there was at that time, well, there still is, but it's, it's, it was much bigger then. There was a big department at the University of Birmingham called the Third Sector Research Centre. Mm -hmm. And I'd done loads of work in and around and on right. the third and with the third mm -hmm. sector. So mm -hmm. I applied to them to become a fellow and they accepted me. And since then, I've always had a fellowship. Um, when their funding was, a bunch of their funding was withdrawn a few years later and they stopped running their fellowship scheme as a result. I then moved to the uh, National Center for Research Methods and became a fellow there for a while. 
And um, then when things changed there, I moved to Methods at Manchester, where I'm, I'm now a fellow at Manchester University, working primarily mm -hmm. with Methods mm -hmm. at Manchester. And these fellowships are invaluable. They're unpaid. Um, I'm usually required to do something like two unpaid days of work for the department. And in return, mm -hmm. I get access to academic literature. I get mentoring. Yeah, I get networking right. opportunities. Um, and I don't have to be part of an organization, which I don't want to be. I've never wanted right. to be an academic. Right. Right. My academic friends just spend so much time complaining to me about academia that I've mm. never felt keen mm -hmm. to join. Right. Well, you mentioned, uh, you know, thinking about your initial book. And since then, you know, one of the roles that I wanted to discuss with you is your work as an editor and creating a couple of different book series that allowed you to you know, not only, you know, kind of get your own work out, you know, with the books that you've authored, but to bring together quite an eclectic international group of scholars. And so, you know, I wanted you to just talk a little bit about, you know, kind of your role in, you know, not only boosting your own career and your own credibility, but, you know, creating, um, you know, a type of work that allows you to to celebrate and, and honor uh, the work of other researchers, many of them, you know, emerging, you know, just uh, beginning researchers who have, you know, written extraordinary things, you know, in these, uh, in these collections. Yeah, this has been so much fun, actually, because, um, I mean, when I wrote my first research methods book, I had a, I wrote it, it was published, I had a book launch, I thought, great, that's mm -hmm. that ticked off the bucket list, I don't have to do that again. Mm -hmm. Only it didn't quite work like that because later on I wanted to read a book on creative research methods and found there wasn't one and thought, okay, well, maybe mm -hmm. I better write that one too. And then it snowballed. But more recently, um, I was very honored to have Professor Pat Thompson invite me to co-edit a series with her for Routledge called The Insider Guides to Success in Academia. And we've worked with a number of different authors. Some of our authors are very experienced and didn't need much developmental support. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are others we've worked with who've been much less experienced or not experienced and have needed and do need mm -hmm. developmental support that we're really happy to provide. And I've learned a lot from Pat. She's been a great mentor in this in this kind of work. And while I can't say too much about a couple of new projects, because neither of them are yet under contract, mm -hmm. they do both very much look as though they're going to happen. One of them is another series, which I will be editing myself um, with a different publisher, around creative research methods, short mm -hmm. how-to books on different creative research methods. And another is a handbook I've been invited to edit by a different publisher again, another prestigious publisher, a handbook on creative research methods, which again means I can solicit chapters from around mm -hmm. the world from mm -hmm. really interesting, diverse scholars. And of course, there was the work I did with Policy Press, uh, with Su Ming Ku in the pandemic, right. Right. about um, pulling together information about how researchers were adapting and generating new methods in, under pandemic restrictions. And that was fascinating. And we were right. really able to showcase the work of some quite marginalized researchers, as well as some, again, some quite well-known, more mainstream researchers. And, and I think the compilations we came up with in those three eBooks and then one print book, mm -hmm. um, I was really proud of that work that we did. I right. think that was, that was really great. And, but really, it's our contributors we have to thank, because without them, it would, would have been nowhere near as good. Right. But at the same time, you know, just thinking about the idea of working as an independent scholar and researcher, that you had the, you know, I just keep using the term credibility, and you had the respect that, that someone would trust you to engage in a project like that, you know, with the one about the research during the COVID era, where, you know, you have a fast turnaround time and, you know, you really had to, um, you know, people had to be engaged. I have just one more um, question for you. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, the various kinds of roles that you've had doing uh, independent research projects um, and client oriented work, uh, you know, work as a writer and an editor and uh, those kinds of things, um, you know, having the fellowship that gives you access because, you know, even though many journals are open access today and they're more available than we used to be able to re 
it's still very difficult um, to get access to everything. I think that's one of the constraints that mm -hmm. independent folks have. You know, what other kinds of limitations or uh, kind of, you know, challenges have you encountered as an independent? Well, one thing that really hacks me off is that independent researchers, certainly in the UK, are not eligible even to apply for any research funding that mm. comes through from the government. And the UK government funds a lot of research, so that's a good thing. Does it through research councils? Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. But I think it's so short-sighted that independent researchers cannot even apply because, especially with the precarity now in academia, more people are becoming mm. independent right. researchers and seeing ways to do useful work outside of the academy. And independent researchers often have very low overheads. I have seen university funding bids. Sometimes right. as much as 50% of the government right. funding goes on university overheads. Right. If you fund an independent researcher, they may not need to charge any overheads, or if they do, they'll be very small. And also independent researchers are agile, as we showed in the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. We can make right. changes, we can adapt, we can amend, we can still do hugely effective work under very constraining conditions. And so we can turn stuff around really quickly. Of course, we can't do big projects. And clearly, there's always going to be a need for big teams doing big projects, big research projects. Um, I'm not saying we should be funded instead of those. But there are a bunch of independent researchers who, if they could just access funding of, I don't know, like 20 to 50,000 pounds with dollars, you maybe have to double that to get the equivalent amount. But, you know, we're not talking about mm. massive stratospheric right. amounts of money. Um, but I think an independent researcher could give so much value for right. that comparatively small amount of funding. And that's a big limitation. I really hope that will change, probably not in my working lifetime, but I hope the next generation of independent mm -hmm. researchers will be able to apply on a level playing field for research right. funding. Right, right. There's some kind of mechanism to provide whatever the oversight is that's needed uh, for funding. So... Well, thank you for uh, sharing your experience with us, and I hope that it will be uh, inspiring to our method space readers who are uh, thinking about, you know, their own careers and you know the kinds of things they want to do and, and how to uh, accomplish it in, in in these challenging times. I hope so too. It's a very rewarding career if you can make it work. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>